Well, good morning, Hyvie Baptist Church. I assume you're back there. Hello, how's it going? Hey, welcome. So we're doing this stuff online. It's a little weird, but hey, our God is awesome. And that's, that's like the coolest thing ever. So let's worship him today and let's, uh, let's get our worship on. Yeah. <laughs> You call us out from the depths Into your freedom Our chains are gone No weapon formed shall prevail Your word is stronger
Good morning. I certainly hope you guys had a great week and that things have been going all right for you. We just have a couple of messages. Uh, one of the first things uh, Pastor Steve would like to just just tell everybody to thank them for their flexibility and for all the things that you know everybody's had to come together. We have we just truly have some fantastic teams and just some awesome people that you know the praise team coming in and doing these recordings and having the tech people who without the tech people. We have no live stream, and we just, we really have such an amazing, we have Sandy coming in and playing our music at the beginning, and so we just, just want to, we don't want that to go unappreciated, we just, we have so many really awesome teams and just great people serving in our church, and so we're just so very appreciative of everybody just pulling together as we sort of ride this thing out. So speaking of riding things out, um, stay tuned, uh, we have, we had some things planned and some stuff on the calendar. We're still not 100% sure how all of that's going to work out, so just, uh, again, just keep an ear and an eye out for your, uh, your emails and things like that. 
that will kind of help us uh, know what's, what's coming up and how we're going to deal with some of the things we had planned. Um, again, if you're not receiving the church's emails, uh, give us a call, leave a message with that email. We'll make sure that you get on that list. Also, don't forget to check your spam folder. Uh, for some reason, our uh, emails have a tendency to land in there occasionally. So, again, just a... And then, uh, most importantly, <clears throat> if you need anything... Uh, let us know uh, if there's a need we can meet or if you know somebody who has a need that we can meet uh, Please let us know we, we are we are still running and we're still functioning and so uh, We can we can still meet needs in our community. So with that uh, It's just such an awesome day to be in, in God's house and God's house is also your house So this is actually really an amazing day. So let's go ahead and continue in worship This life brings suffering. i 
says nothing. The king of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering me with your love. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, some of you is all I need. Take everything. You are my life and my treasure The one that I can't live without Here it's your people's eyes and dreams are laid Father, we just thank you that you are all we need and that we can just take it all. And so, Father, we just again, we just invite you into this place and we just honor you this morning. We just love you and thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. I am grateful for those who are able to be here as one of the few who are gathered, <laughs> the worship team and, and pianists and the sound people, and, and that we can still gather even if it's just virtually. Maybe it's a good thing, praise team, that sometimes we sing with nobody sitting here. 
because it reminds us that they're not the audience, right? I mean, the Lord is anyway, but it, it, I, Isaiah did say when he saw the Lord high and holy and lifted up there and the, and, and the beings worshiping him, they were crying and calling out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So it's also, you know, worshipful when we, when we say that with each other too. So I miss you today. The four people here are all spread out, so I got to look all over the place. Y'all couldn't coordinate. We got two blow up kind of cylinders here with faces painted on them to fill the crowd today. What? No, they're burritos. Nobody, nobody knows what we're talking about. Just, it's a weird group up here. Take my word for it. You know, on this Sunday, we were supposed to be uh, Tom and Pam Atkinson and myself. We're going to talk about Athens a little bit and what God is doing there and the refugees that they work with. And I just went for a couple, three weeks to, to help with. I did a lot of fishing that we talked about the last couple times I preached with you with uh, primarily Afghan refugees. And it was quite interesting to be there as Kabul was falling and people were trying to get out of the airport. And, but anyway, and, and I think Jacob was going to share about his recent mission trip as well until all this uh, kind of happened. And a few, some of our folks came down with COVID and we're just trying to keep everybody safe. But I do want to still talk to you about Athens today, but I don't want to talk about my experiences in, in Athens. I, I do want to talk about the Apostle Paul's experience in the city of Athens. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 17. If you're at home, get your Bibles out and uh, put your feet up, get comfortable, but don't get so comfortable you fall asleep, all right? And while you're turning, I, I heard a quote in, uh, it's from J.R. Tolkien's The Fellowship of the Ring. Now, I, don't, I haven't read that series of, of novels, hadn't watched the movies. That I don't read for pleasure. I read to, to learn and to research, but I, I don't read for pleasure. I don't enjoy reading that much. But uh, in in that series of, I think there's a series of them, there's a, there's a character named Galadriel who is the elf queen. That already tells me I don't want to read it. I don't, you know, an elf queen. I don't know, it just sounds a little bizarre, but maybe you're into that. And she's paid, played by Kate Blanchett in the movie, but she says a classic line about changes happening in Middle Earth. She says to Frodo, the world has changed. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the earth. I smell it in the air, unquote. Well, I don't know about Middle Earth, but I do know that the world around us has changed dramatically in the last few decades, particularly here in our country and in our culture. And it seems to be changing more rapidly all the time, doesn't it? I mean, just you think about all that's changed in just the last couple, three, four years even, it seems like the farther we, we move away from certain things, the faster we, we, we start moving away from, like a, like a ball rolling down a hill. When you older adults who are listening this morning were growing up and having kids, I mean, when I say older, I mean probably a little older than me. I'm almost 60. Those of you who are a little older, and I'm looking at one or two here today. Uh, when you were growing up... <laughs> I mean, most people possessed and respected many of the Judeo-Christian values and, and ethics and influences that our nation was founded upon. I mean, even those who didn't claim any belief in Christ or God at least had some sense of the storyline of the Bible and its main characters. Some of you, this wasn't happening where I went to school when I was growing up, but probably not long before I was in grade school and junior high. Many of you had the Ten Commandments posted in your, in your classroom in a public school. And, and, and prayers were often offered along with the Pledge of Allegiance. Now, we used to say the Pledge every day when I was growing up, but I don't remember praying too often, except maybe when a major catastrophe happened. You know, everybody prays, right? It's amazing how religious and spiritual people get when things really get bad. But the Bible was read many times in classrooms, even as literature, if nothing else, and and. People didn't think anything about it. Creation was taught not only as the possible, but even as the probable explanation for everything that exists. And Christian people and pastors were generally respected by almost everybody in the community. And, and, and when we talk to someone about Jesus and sin and turn to the scriptures to explain to people their need of Christ... They understood much of what we were talking about, and they generally accepted the Bible as the Word of God, whether they chose to live by it or not. Th that was our country and our culture not that long ago, quite honestly. 
But about the time that my generation was being born, in the early, early 60s, <laughs> a shift began to take place. And over the past 50 or 60 years, our country and culture has become increasingly more and more post-Christian. The influences and values and belief shaping these younger generations are no longer aligned with Christianity. I I'm not saying that to, to, to dish them. I'm just saying that's reality. That's how they've grown up. Most in our culture don't have a basic understanding of the Bible. They don't see any problem in worshiping many gods as opposed to, to one true God or no God at all. They are open to and accept all types of faith, including mixtures of many. And, and, and they don't believe that, that truth is absolute to begin with. And so people are not only free to believe however they want to, that's always been the case in our free country, thankfully. But, but now everyone's beliefs are just as credible as everyone else's, whether it has any objective foundation or not. If you don't think that's true, I, I saw the news just a, a week or two ago. Our vice president went to some university to speak to some group. I don't remember who it was. But, but a statement that she made captured even our culture's uh, uh, you know, uh, minds and that's saying something believe me but some young college student some young girl said made some comments about Israel that was just totally off the wall and instead of respectfully trying to kind of straighten out the fact of this young lady our, our vice president said well I am so glad that it is so important that you speak your truth and that you stand by that I wanted to say well well what does it matter what your truth is if it isn't the truth you know but that's the way our culture thinks. Your truth is as good as my truth, and my truth is as good as your truth. And it doesn't really matter if it's true or not in reality. Now, any of you who have taken time or made the effort to talk to people in depth about spiritual things outside of our comfortable Christian community have doubtlessly discovered the absolute biblical illiteracy of most people in our culture today. And again, I'm not trying to, to, to speak disparagingly of people. That's just where we are. I don't, they don't know the story of creation. They don't know the Ten Commandments that our laws were established upon as this nation. They don't have a clear, if any, concept of who Jesus is or how his life transformed history. They have been fed from the time that they were young students in school and, and through the Discovery Channel and Bill Nye, the science guy, and every field trip that they took to a natural history museum, that evolution is a proven fact, as sure and established as the law of gravity. Even though evolution is not only a theory, it's really, in the strictest sense, not even a scientific theory. Because it's not observable or repeatable or testable. But it's still taught that way. But, you know, and it, and it can get discouraging, can't it? <laughs> you know? I mean, I don't know about you, but it just aggravates the living daylights out of me occasionally. But before we throw up our hands and surrender what, to what seems to be the inevitable spiritual demise of our nation in particular... Let me just remind you that the first century world into which Christ entered in the flesh and the church was birthed was not a whole lot different in many respects. I mean, ours has indeed moved to this very post-Christian kind of culture, but it's very similar to the pre-Christian culture that the early church was commissioned to reach with the gospel particularly places like Athens where Paul found himself during his second missionary journey. Now, I'm not going to give you all the historical background and details of all this, but I want to just pick up the story in Acts chapter 17, verse 16, where it says that while Paul was waiting for them, now he was waiting for Silas and Timothy. Remember, this was his second missionary journey. His first missionary journey was with, with, with Barnabas and John Mark, you remember? And he got back from that one. Now it was the second missionary journey. This time he took Silas because Paul and Barnabas had a little, uh, little uh, tiff over taking John Mark again because John Mark had deserted them, you remember? And Paul said, we ain't taking him again. No way, no how. I ain't got time to put up with that stuff, right? And Barnabas, Mr. Encourager, said, come on, Paul. and said, I ain't doing it. So he took Silas and Timothy. Now, they got to Thessalonica a little bit prior to where we're reading. And in Thessalonica, there was a group that kind of rose up against them and caused such a stir Paul and Silas and, and Timothy had to, to get out of there under the cloak of darkness. And they made it their way to Berea. And in Berea, they, they started to have some impact there. And then the same group that caused problems in Thessalonica followed them there. And uh, Paul slipped out, but 
Silas and Timothy were kind of a little lower key and were able to stay there and do a little more work in Berea. So now Paul's in Athens by himself, all right? I feel very similar to him because I was in Athens. I mean, Tom and Pam were there, but they were doing things that they needed to do. And I, I was, most of my day, except for a week, that I was with one of my former deacons uh, who came and, and, and worked with me for about a week of my time there. I, I walked around Athens a lot and just talked to people. And, and uh, so I kind of know how Paul felt sitting around Athens. I walked up to Mars Hill by myself, you know, a couple times, and it was not far of a walk. And there was Paul, just like me, hanging out in Athens, you know, looking for opportunities. And while he was waiting for them, it says, in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace by, day by day with those who happened to be there. And a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And then they took him and brought him to the, a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. And all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. And then Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men and they, sh they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. And God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design or skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. And when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. And others said, we want to hear, again on, hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. <clears throat> Some observers have wisely pointed out that the world that you and I now live in and that we're trying to reach with the gospel is much more like ancient Athens than it was ancient Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, the church was surrounded by people who knew God's book, they knew God's laws, you know, they knew the Old Testament anyway, which is the only thing that had been written to that point. They certainly were keenly aware of who Jesus claimed to be and his life and his, and, and, and his miracles and, and his message and his death on the cross and, and the stories of his resurrection. Whether they believed who he was he claimed to be or, or not, they were familiar with the stories. I mean, it, had, it created quite an uproar there in, in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. But in places like Athens especially, people didn't know the scriptures, at least outside of the synagogue. And all sorts of religions were observed and commingled, and every new idea, Luke says here in this text, was not only tolerated, but, but even celebrated. Except, of course, for those that taught the exclusivity of others and accountability to a holy God. Those were not looked upon quite so favorably, we see. It sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Our culture has moved from being a Jerusalem to being an Athens. 
Increasingly, the good news about Jesus sounds like some strange ideas to, to people, j just as it did to the Athenians, as Luke tells us there in verse 20. And it's no wonder Paul's message about Jesus and the resurrection was so foreign, therefore, and strange to these people. Athens, in its heyday, several centuries before Christ, you remember, was, was the greatest city in the world by many respects. I, I mean, it was in Athens that Socrates and Plato and Aristotle all taught as did Epicurus, the founder of Epicureanism, and Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, which had grown to be the, become the two dominant philosophies during Paul's day in the first century. And, and though Corinth was surpassed by Athens as, the, as kind of the central political and commercial hub, Athens was still the world's kind of center of, of thought and, and of philosophy. It, it, it had still the most famous university in the ancient world. And as a Hellenized Jew, Paul would have been exposed and, and would, would have been familiar with Greek art and literature and philosophy during his own quite distinguished educational background. And he displays that in this discourse to these people, the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus was a council of, uh, of, of heirs. In Latin, it's Mars, and that's why we call it Mars Hill sometimes, so, but the Areopagus was a group, you know, kind of the thinkers and the movers and the shakers, the, the philosophers and the problem solvers and the, uh, of the day. And Mars Hill, I was just there a few weeks ago. It was fascinating. First time I've ever been there. It, it's not that much to look at. It's just this rocky mound, but it's just kind of this little peak right in the shadow of the Acropolis. And you can see a lot of the whole city from there. It's an amazing view. It's a, it's a great place to go. I was about a 10-minute walk, 15-minute walk from there. And, and it was fascinating to walk around there where I knew Paul had been, you know. But there was Paul speaking to this group of men, this tribunal who met to rule on various issues and hear all the latest ideas. And surrounding Mars Hill was this city full not only of the latest ideas, but also thousands of statues of gold and silver and stone and bronze, to every kind of god that man could imagine. And most of the gods worshipped by the Greeks were, were really a deification of certain human attributes or, or powers of nature. And as, as Paul said in Romans 1.25, they had, like men has done, mankind has done through the ages, exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they had begun to worship and serve the created things, as Paul says, rather than the creator. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. One ancient historian quipped that it was easier to find a God in Athens during that period than it was a man. They were everywhere. And it was no doubt that idolatry in particular that that robbed God of his glory and so demonstrated man's willful rebellion against God's obvious revelation in creation and man's conscience that so distressed the Apostle Paul. In fact, Luke here uses this word, the exact same word that he used to speak of Paul's, you know, somewhat angry frustration that arose between him and Barnabas overtaking Mark along with him on this journey. He, he got really upset about it. Have you ever watched something on the news on TV or read in the newspaper? No, nobody gets newspapers anymore. <laughs> on the internet or, or whatever that, that just is such an example, you know, of, of the spiritual darkness of our culture and the disrespect for God in our culture that you just want to scream. I mean, sometimes I do. My wife, you know, has to go outside. I just yell at the television set like they can hear me. You know, I know. It saves me from throwing it out in the middle of the street, though, because I just, you know, ah! You know, what I'm, you know what I mean? You do it too, don't you? I know you do. You just don't tell people. Well, that's what Paul felt like doing, I think, when he saw all these idols everywhere. But fortunately, the Apostle Paul is a little more spiritual than me, and, and he sought to shed some light into that darkness instead, which is probably a better option. He not only went to the synagogue with the good news about Jesus Christ, but into the city square where people not only shopped for what they needed, but sat and visited about the latest news and, and to share the latest ideas and it was there that he met some of these proponents of the two chief philosophies of that day and in the worldviews of that day, both of which began to then gang up on the Apostle Paul because the gospel that he proclaimed brought their streams of thinking not only into question, but, but it really was calling for a complete change in direction. Now, you've got to understand a little bit about what these people thought, what their worldview was to, to kind of appreciate 
where Paul started from and why he started where he did. The Epicureans, if you know much about them, basically held that the chief end of life is maximum pleasure and minimal pain. That's kind of their philosophy. They were pure materialists who said, in essence, this life is all there is. You only go around once, so go for all the gusto you can. Now, they weren't complete hedonists. They didn't necessarily just go wild and crazy, necessarily. But they believed that man's ultimate goal was to make himself happy. Just to live for that. You couldn't do any better. Spiritually, most believed that there were gods, but those gods you know, just kind of sat off at a distance. They didn't really have anything to do with, with our human a- activities and engagements. They weren't interested in our affairs. And, and to the Epicureans, everything just sort of happened by chance, and death was the end. It just meant extinction. There was no afterlife. There was no nothing. I mean, you breathed your last breath, the lights went out, and game was over. That, that's really... Epicureanism, sort of, in a nutshell, if I can kind of capture that. And do you know anybody like that today? You probably know many who live, at least to some degree, by that kind of pleasure first, do what makes me happy, avoid pain kind of philosophy. I mean, I try to avoid pain too. I don't know about you, but, you know, I've got Advil in my closet for sure. But if you ask them, they might believe in a god or gods of some sort. You know, there are very few really true atheists in the world. You have to really work hard at being an atheist. You really do. And even atheists aren't people of faith. You realize that. Everybody believes something. But, they, you know, so they believed in, in, in a god or gods. I mean, you look around their city. They were everywhere. But that belief really made no impact on their lives whatsoever. So they just kind of you know, live to get all the gusto again they could. And, you know, if, if you believe this is all there is in life and, and when you, and you breathe your last breath, that's it? Well, I mean, wouldn't you live that way too? Of course you would. Even the Apostle Paul said, man, if Christ isn't raised and, and what we're preaching is, is just craziness, well, then we're of all men most to be pitied. We might as well eat, drink, and be merry, right? I mean, I think the Apostle Paul would, would have been an Epicurean if, if he hadn't understood the gospel. My friends on the, in the Far East, you know, the highest wish they can give you is happy every day. And they're always concerned about their health. I mean, just to a fault, you, you know, because they believe this is all there is. And then there were the Stoics, who unlike the Epicureans, they didn't believe that everything happened by chance. That They believed that everything happened by faith, which is a little bit different. Whatever happened to them was just their destiny. And, and the best you could do to, was just to kind of learn how to endure life without letting it blow you out of the water. The Epicureans' motto was enjoy life. The Stoics' motto was endure life. I mean, we might say, you know, the Epicureans were a little more optimistic and the Stoics were a little more pessimistic. My wife would tell you I lean toward the Stoic side. <laughs> but, but, you know, there was just kind of a grin and bear it kind of philosophy. Spiritually, they were pantheists. Now, a pantheist is someone who believes that God is just everywhere and in everything. And and so their idea of the afterlife wasn't that of extinction like the Epicureans, but it was just kind of the pathway into absorption back into the divine essence. Now, if you sit with your thumb and this finger together and your thumb and this finger together and you cross your legs and you go, um, long enough, that sounds really good. <laughs> I'm sorry I don't have anybody here to react quite to that. All right. I'm just saying. But there are many Stoics around us in our world today as well. I, I mean, philosophically and spiritually. I, I flipped by an interview with, with Morgan Freeman on TV a while back. And the interviewer asked him about his belief in an afterlife because he had, he had recently been in a car accident that very easily could have taken his life. And Morgan Freeman gave the, the, the cl- classic stoic answer. He said, God is in everything and everyone. Isn't that pretty much the way it has to be? And again, I screamed at my television set, No! You idiot! I didn't say, well, maybe I did say idiot. I don't remember. But, but you know, in fact, that logically... It can't be that way. 
And how many do you know that live with no real sense of divine presence or guidance in their lives? Things are just the way they are, so they just grin and bear it. Every day they get up and they go to work, they do their thing, so they can make enough money to go to their house that they're going to owe on for 30 years and, and, and raise kids that don't listen to them half the time so they can get up the next day to start it all over again and do it again day after day after day after day after day till they're finally just reabsorbed back into the divine essence, whatever that is. So how do we go about impacting this post-Christian culture in which we live? That's the real question. You know, part of a pastor-teacher's job, now I'm not your pastor, but, but I have been a pastor and teacher, and I come from that mindset, but part of, part of our job is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So I want to try to equip you a little bit today, if I can. How should we approach people living more on Mars Hill than in the synagogue? How do we communicate a message that answers the life or death problem that most people don't even realize they have, that they're told about, that we're told about in a book that, that they don't know anything about? When Paul spoke to those in the synagogues, he could at least start with the scripture. And he could show them the dozens and dozens of prophecies, specific things about the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ that displayed and demonstrated and proved who he was. That he was the Messiah they had been waiting so long for. But Paul was wise enough to know that a different worldviews required a different approach. He always shared with people the claims of Christ, but he approached those in the marketplace totally different than how he approached people in the synagogue. And I think we have to start doing the same. If we're not real careful, we're kind of stuck in these ruts as the church about, and we just kind of expect people to know all these things that we've grown up, many of us knowing and understanding and learning. And listen, most of the world around us, at least that are under 70, don't have a clue about those things. So we've got to start in a different place. So allow me from Paul's example, at least to make us stop and think about what might be a better way for us to share with some of those people that we know who have grown up and who are products of this post-Christian culture in which we live. And, and a good first step is just to, just to apprehend their religion. By that I mean you got to get a handle on what they indeed believe or don't believe. And, and you get to know people a little bit and pay attention, and some things are probably going to begin to clue you in, even before you bring up any kind of spiritual issues or have any kind of, uh, of gospel conversation with them. As Paul walked around Athens in our text, we, he, he saw all these idols everywhere. And, and he listened to all these worldviews being presented in the city square and, and at the Areopagus. And he began to put the pieces together pretty easily. He, he, he saw these people are very religious, but they were also all very spiritually confused. Now, observation will tell you a whole lot, but so will a little interrogation. Now, I don't mean putting a spotlight on them and you know, you know, making them sweat, but I mean just asking them questions. As you try to apprehend what someone believes or doesn't believe, you might look for an opportunity to ask some open-ended questions. You know, like, like in your personal opinion, what do you understand it takes for, for a person to go to heaven or to have eternal life? Or do you even believe that there is life after we breathe our last death you just think that's all there is and so why do you believe that you know in your opinion what, what, what do you understand it takes to have a personal relationship with God can we even have a, a personal relationship with God you believe and believe there is a God ask some things like that respectfully and lovingly and then listen and respond the same way but their answer to that question will tell you much about what they believe or what they don't believe about God and who he is and about them and, and, and what they're, you know, why they live their life the way that they do and how to have a relationship with God if they do believe he exists. You know, I never take anybody's word for it when they say, oh, I'm a Christian. I don't even ask them that way. You know why? Because many people have a whole lot of different ideas about what it means to be a Christian. Some of them are not that good and a whole lot of them aren't very accurate, you know? And there's reasons for that because, quite honestly, they haven't had a, <laughs> they have, they haven't got a very good picture from a, a lot of the church in the world today. When they say, "Well, I'm a Christian," I say, "Well, what do you what do you think that means exactly? What do you think it means to uh, what do you think it was required to make you a Christian?" 
you know, you, you got to interrogate just a little bit. You got to find out why people are where they are and what they believe, what they do. And as Paul was visiting with people and observing their lives around the city, he saw among all these idols and altars an altar with the inscription designating a place of worship to this unknown God. I think the Apostle Paul, as he was walking around like I did a few weeks ago around that city, you know, just looking for some open door and some avenue to begin a conversation about spiritual things with people, he saw, he said, ah, that's the perfect spot to start. <laughs> the unknown God. I think I'll tell him about that one. It's interesting that the word translated unknown there is the root from which we get our word agnosticism. Of course, it isn't it that God cannot be known, but as Paul points out in Romans 1, again, men don't want to know him. Men just willfully deny the truth, he says. God has made himself known even in creation, but they willfully reject that revelation. And interestingly, that's exactly where the Apostle Paul began his discussion when he was brought before the Areopagus. He, he applauded the fact that they were obviously religious and doubtlessly very earnest in what they believed. He appreciated that fact, but then he approached the message of Christ by beginning where they were in their understanding and by going through this open door at this altar that he had discovered that as he looked for a way to share Christ with them. You know, can I, can I share with you quite honestly, if you're asking the Lord to give you an open door to start a conversation with, them, with, some, with someone or, you know, he, I found that he usually answers that prayer if we're looking for it. It's amazing kind of goes along with you know that verse says it's not his will that any should perish but that all should come to repentance well i think he cares about them he's going to give you that opportunity if you're asking and you're looking and so here's this opportunity in front of the apostle paul and he takes this first step you know where he started exactly where the bible starts that's a pretty good place to start i've discovered quite honestly we can't start with people in understanding until we take give enough time to find out where that is. We have to apprehend the religion or their beliefs, their worldview. And then when we do, I think the next great step is to appeal to their reason. You know, many today sort of feel that most of us Christians are sort of ignorant, kind of foolish. We sort of, you know, spout off things that have been taught to us in Sunday school without really any serious thought or investigation. And, and sadly, for, for many, that is true, isn't it? Let's just be honest. Too many people don't know why they believe what they do, and we ought to. Church, we, we got to do a better job at that, quite honestly. Somebody asks you what you believe, you better have a good reason for believing it. Because that is kind of ignorant. But, but, but Christianity is not ignorant. <laughs> Not at all. And if we hope to engage this Athenian culture in which we live with the gospel, we have to help them understand that. I mean, even these Athenians thought Paul was a mindless babbler too at first. He said, what is this mindless babbler talking about? The word literally there means seed picker. That's what it literally means. It's the picture of a person who just kind of picks up this idea and picks up that idea from here and there and everywhere and just sort of spouts them back, you know, like he really knows what he's talking about. That's what they thought the Apostle Paul was. This guy, oh, he's kind of learning some things here and there, and he just, he doesn't. This guy, he hadn't thought through any of this. But when they brought him before the Areopagus, he challenged their thinking, and they, and they started looking at him a little differently. And we, too, need to help people understand that biblical faith is not blind faith. It's not ignorant faith it's not irrational faith at all it's based upon the obvious revelation of creation and the verifiable facts of history and paul started with and then developed the implication of the very foundational truth that god is the creator and the sustainer of everything again isn't it interesting that that's exactly where the bible starts by the way you know when i talk to people who don't know a thing about god or about jesus and i talk to a lot of people like that on the other side of the planet particularly or what they do know they've been taught is just fable or fairy tale and many times when they get serious and they get interested i have them start reading where in the very first chapters of genesis do you know why 
Because if we don't understand that we have a God who created us to whom we are accountable and that we turned our backs on him, why would we understand our need for a Savior to be right with him? You have to have some foundational knowledge and truth to even get to the gospel. Right? And again, evolution is taught as this unquestionable fact in schools and on TV and almost everywhere else. And in truth, there are only two types of views about the origins of matter and man creation, and some form of evolution, right? If someone doesn't believe that there's an infinite being who created all, and, and the only alternative is to that is some form of e- evolution. And the Greeks, like these Paul were speaking to, believed in really a form of evolution. In their eyes, there was no one creator God who had authority over all of them. And Paul knew that without that clear understanding, these people would never understand their need for a Savior and to be right with the God of the universe. And so he starts there. So Paul begins by really uh, appealing to their reason, because quite honestly, I, I think creation is the only reasonable explanation for everything and everyone that exists. As much as someone to make Christians look like idiots for believing it. In fact, as Paul made clear, they really show their ignorance for falling for that lie. I mean, any truly reasonable person, think about it, can see it. I think. And and, and I would be the first to acknowledge that you can't prove the existence of God by means of scientific experiment or mathematical equation. You can't do it. Can't prove creation that way. Not going to happen. But it is rational and logical just on the basis of cause and effect and the intricately amazing design of all that is, not to mention several other things. I mean, just use our brains for a little bit. I know common sense isn't all that common anymore, but let's try, shall we? I mean, no one would look at Mount Rushmore. I took my wife to Mount Rushmore uh, a couple summers ago. It was our 35th wedding anniversary, and she'd never been to the Black Hills and Mount Rushmore. I'd been through there on a motorcycle a time or two. And uh, so we went to Mount Rushmore. And no one would look at those faces carved in that mountainside. Or or no one would go to the Great Wall of China, where I've been, I don't know, 20 times at least now, or something, and, and, uh, and look at that structure built across those mountains, you know, and all those blocks laid, and the thousands of people that died doing it. Or, or you wouldn't go to New York City and look at the Empire State Building standing there in, in the middle of that giant city and include that those things just naturally occurred over millions or billions of years uh, of erosion or, or a result of some explosion of matter. Right? If you want to see what an explosion of matter does, you'd have to now go and look at the pictures in the World Trade Center Museum of what happened to those two towers when they exploded and they disintegrated into a pile of rubble. That's what happens when things explode. They don't come together in magnificent, intricately designed order. They collapse into chaos. Right? Even even secular scientists get excited when they discover simple stone tools together with bones in a cave somewhere because they realize that's an indication of intelligence. Really? Yeah. As simple as those tools might be. Hey, these people knew something. Yeah. Yeah. They know intrinsically, logically, rationally, those tools could not have designed themselves. We see man-made objects all around us all the time, cars and planes and houses and computers. And at no time would anybody in their right mind conclude that those intricate objects were just a problem of random chance and time. Right? If somebody thought that, we'd go, grrr, right? That's why the Bible says you'd have to be a fool to believe that there is no God. I didn't say that. He did. Every aspect of creation points directly to a personal, purposeful, intelligent, eternal creator. And with that appeal to these men's reason, Paul automatically addressed their practic- the practical atheism of these Epicureans. He also respectfully challenged their materialism. I mean, the belief that matter is, is eternal and physical matter is the only reality Because if he created all that is, he he must have existed before all that came into being, right? 
Only God is eternal. And again, it comes back to a simple cause and effect. And every effect must have a cause. And somewhere there must have been an original cause. And we know that original cause as the eternal, almighty God of the universe. He also challenges their polytheism. The the belief that there are, 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 are many gods, as is evident in their thousands of idols that they have built all around that city. The one God who created all that is must be the one true God of the universe. He's the only God who exists not only because we made him with our own hands or made him up in our own minds, but he was the one true God because he made us and everything else that exists. That's the only rational and only reasonable conclusion. And Paul confronts their, their, their idolatry at this point by making it clear that if If we were created by God, then how could we rationally think that we can make God out of gold or silver or stone? If God created man, then he must be more than a mere man-made idol. Right? I mean, I think think how irrational and reasonable it is. How, How absurd Paul must have thought this situation was to be standing there in the city that boasted the greatest university in the world located where some of the supposedly greatest minds in history had produced were produced and they were worshiping things made with their own hands how can people be so educated and yet be so ignorant well it's not really just ignorance but in truth it's defiance against a God who they don't want to bow to. Paul also was confronting the pantheism of those Stoics who were on the other side. Their belief that God is in matter or is matter, that God can be found in the creation itself, that God and the universe are identical. If the physical universe has an initial cause who must be intelligent, powerful, and personal to, to, to not only produce but to design such an intricate planet and universe then he must again have existed before that creation and must stand outside of and over that creation. God could not have created himself. That's just unreasonable and irrational. Yes? Listen, there's a whole lot of unbiblical, irrational thinking being blatantly and subtly presented as truth from secular schools and secular media and secular culture that we live in that's willing to swallow almost any kind of belief except that of a holy God who is the author of everything. And we need to not only not let them intimidate us, but we need to lovingly and respectfully appeal to their reason and point them to the clear revelation of God in creation so that they have a platform upon which then we have a platform upon which to begin to share the message of the gospel of why and how God, the Son, came in the flesh to make a way to restore us back to a right relationship with God who created us for that purpose. And then the third step, because i, I got to hurry on here. I don't know what time it is. Oh, yeah, let me hurry. After we've apprehended their religion and appealed to their reason, one of the things we have to appeal to is the resurrection of Christ. Now, I have no doubt that Paul told them about the cross and why Christ had come and suffered and died. It says that, that Paul says, it says here in, in this chapter that Paul preached the gospel of Jesus and the resurrection. He kind of points that out. No doubt he told them about his miraculous life and his sacrificial death on that cross and why that was so important. But he emphasized most importantly to this crowd the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the part that, that, that first got their attention in which Paul eventually went, it says in verse 31, to prove who Christ was, the, the, the God and the judge of this world which he created for himself. And all men eventually die, don't they? I mean, regardless of their belief about any afterlife, whether like the Epicure, Epicureans, they think, well, this is all there is, you know, lights out. Or whether they're like the Stoics who believe that it's just the door to reabsorption. Or whatever anybody believes about life and death and the afterlife and all those things. We all die. Physically, right? 
My old social studies teacher up in Aurora told us you only have to do two things in this world. Two things in life. Die and pay your taxes. That's what she said. <laughs> I've tried to be faithful to pay my taxes. I'm just waiting to die. All right. <laughs> and by the way, you're not getting any of that back either. I mean, you get some of it, but not near as much as you put in. All right. That's, just, that's a whole other thing. All right. <laughs> but the fact is, listen, there's only one person who's been proved dead and rose back to life three days later that stayed alive. I mean, God called Lazarus out of the tomb after four days, I know, but he, did, he didn't come out in an eternal body. He again died physically at some point. But, but, uh, but Jesus rose from the dead victorious over death that we all fear and face. And that fact is historically undeniable to anyone who is willing to consider the evidence. You just can't honestly explain away the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ if you look at all the historical evidence for it. You can't do it. You'd have to be out of your mind or willfully deny the truth. One or the other. Josh McDowell said a long time ago, and I love this quote, he said, you know, Jesus was either a liar, he was a lunatic, or he was Lord. He's one of those three. He was lying about who he was, and, and, and that he was God's son, he was, or he was just some kind of religious lunatic. I mean, there's been a lot of people who've claimed to be the Messiah, right? Yeah, there's a lot of quacks out there. I, I, I admit that to you. And so G, maybe Jesus was just another lunatic. Or he was Lord. And I submit to you that when he came out of that tomb three days after being dead, just as had been prophesied centuries before by the eternal God of the universe, he proved with, in no uncertain terms that he is the Lord he claimed to be, period. You know why part of the reason I believe in creation as the Bible teaches it? It's because Jesus did. He referred to the book of Genesis as law. He, 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 he understood. Well, I tell you, not the greatest scientific minds in the world were around at that point, but Jesus was. Durr. Okay. Let me get to the last thing. Finally, notice what Paul did after appealing to their reason and to Christ's resurrection. He did what we must at some point do when we're engaging this post-Christian culture. We have to apprise them of the appropriate response. Which is to what? Paul said it was to repent. To turn back to the God who created us for himself. That's the only appropriate response. If God is God, if he's the creator of the universe, and if Jesus was his son who came for us, that's the only reasonable response. Paul told them that, that in the past God overlooked such ignorance. Believing in all he's got and taking all these things and, and denying the reality of a creator God. But he will not overlook it forever, Paul said, because all men will have to stand before God without excuse because all who are willing to look honestly, even at the creation alone, must believe that God exists and that we owe him our lives. And now that the fullness of his revelation has come in Christ, God in the flesh, we must recognize that we have sinned against that God who created us by seeking to be our own God and by going our own way and doing our own thing. And one day, everybody's going to have to stand before that very one who came to be our Savior, and he's going to serve as our judge. And with that made clear, the Bible says that those on Mars Hill that day made three different responses. Some sneered. You know, some people are just going to think you're an idiot. Doesn't matter how much evidence you give them. They're going to sneer. Buck up. Get used to it. Consider yourself in good company. Others sandbagged. You know, they said, well, you know, Paul, hmm, we want to hear a little bit more about that later. Let's think about that. Let's come back and talk about that more. Okay. But we never told that they ever heard Paul again or had another chance to respond. You know, that's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. That doesn't mean you have to make that decision today. But boy, once you come to understand the truth, you better get off the stick and get with it, man. And a few others surrendered in faith to Jesus Christ that Paul proclaimed. They, they made the only appropriate response, the only wise and rational choice by turning to God who created them and came for them to redeem them and to restore them to himself. 
Many still sneer, many still sandbag. They work hard at trying to explain all that is by some far-fetched natural process that excludes any need for God whatsoever. Because if there is indeed a God who created us and created all that is, we owe him our total allegiance in our lives. That's why they don't want to believe it. But if there's a creator, then man's not the master. That's the point. And all the rational historical evidence points directly to that truth. And the Bible makes it clear that the one true God who was in the beginning is also the word who became flesh and dwelt among us to prove that he was God when he came out of that tomb. And that's what we need to lovingly explain to this post-Christian world in which we live. And that's what I hope you have come to understand this morning, if you haven't. Listen, there is a God who created you. Fortunately, that God created you because he loves you. And he wants a relationship with you. And if you don't know him today, Paul said, all you got to do is repent. You got to turn from going your way, doing your thing. And say, God, I'm ready to surrender you as the God of my life and the Lord of my life. And I entrust myself to you. And I ask you to forgive me for going my own way, for turning my back on you, for denying the truth about you. And, and God, I just give my life, all that's left of it, to you. And I ask you to be my Savior and my King. I hope that maybe some of you will do as some of these at Mars Hill did that day. And you'll surrender in faith to Jesus Christ who proved he was Lord. Father, we come to you today. I thank you for the opportunity to stand in that city where Paul was a few weeks ago and to just share the gospel with people, particularly from the Middle East and almost all the Islam faith. And What a challenge it is, Lord, to, to live in the day in which we live, and yet we, we know that it's no challenge for you and so, Father, I pray that you'd find us obedient to just share the good news, to start where people are at, to love them there, and then to lovingly walk with them, hopefully, to where they come to know you as the Lord and their King. Lord, we thank you for loving us and for coming, for sacrificially giving yourself for our sake and for our sin on that cross. And we just rejoice in you today. And we pray that you'd be glorified by our worship because you are God. And we're not. And we thank you in Jesus' name, our Savior. Say. 
Well, God bless you guys. Remember, check your emails for updates on what's happening for the rest of the week. And as always, if there's a need that you need, needs to be filled, please let us know and we'll actually take care of it. So God bless you. Have a great week.